Hello everybody, Howard Flights Productions here and we are at Turidin Airport. Turidin is a small private airport to the southeast of Moorabbin and it is home to many, many milestones for myself in real aviation. Uh, Turidin is the airport where I completed all my solo flights in real life. And uh, I look forward to uh, going back to Moorabbin, flying to Turidin and training and flying solo again. So um, that will happen in November in real life of course. and um, Hopefully, it will be it will come around soon. But anyway, this is not the point of the video. The point of the video is that uh, we are going to do a navigation exercise using um, compass and timer and navlog, the traditional way. And we're going to navigate from here to Latro Valley to Leon Gatha and then back here again. We are not going to land at any of the airports that are planned. We're going to overfly it, and uh, yeah, and also. This is the third time I'm doing this. Uh, first time my audio didn't work. Second time, Accusim crashed. And this is the third time. Third time's lucky, as they say. If I will crack it open. Oh, let's see my controls. See if it works. Yeah, it looks about right. Uh, okay, that's, that's fine. And crack it open. Battery on, I've run it already, and uh, just uh, clear prop and hope for the best. Okay. Okay, it works. Extra rich. Follow a thousand. Both ignition circuits work. Get that headset in. Wait for the beep. Beep, there we go. Landing, uh, taxi and nav later on, and let's set our, actually, let's go, let's lean that mixture out a bit. Actually, let's check our maintenance hangar as well, see if there are any issues with this aircraft. Nope, like new. Don't know how that happens, but anyway, uh, let's set our NDB to uh, 486, that's Latrobe Valley NDB. Uh, that will help us a little bit, hopefully. So we don't get lost that badly. Hopefully that doesn't get. Uh, hopefully we don't get lost, and hopefully it goes as well as my first try. My first try went really well. Just that I didn't manage to get it on tape because my audio didn't work. Well, anyway, all that aside, let's get going. Let's point ourselves into the wind and line up. We have a um, northerly um, today, and uh, so yeah, just nothing special. Just a northerly. Because a cold front has just moved in, that's what usually happens. Let's see if my fuel flow works. Does my fuel flow work? Yeah, it works. Right. Controls are already done. Uh, gas. Uh, brakes are holding. They all work. That all works. Idols good. I'm rushing a bit. I really shouldn't, but um, it's late, and this is my third try. I'm getting a bit frustrated at my simulator, but nevertheless, third time's lucky. Let's go. And we're gonna take off runway zero four today. Brakes are creaking. That's no good. Okay. Okay, mixture goes to rich. Okay, no car heat to think about. There's fuel injected. Uh, taxi right onto the runway. Runway 04. Uh, many, many good memories. I remember um, holding short of 04, uh, waiting for a, I believe it's called a Nanchang CJ6 uh, coming into land. Uh, because um, Turidin is also the home of Adventure Flights Melbourne. So. Um, and they, they operate Nanchang CJ6s for joyrides. So, that's very interesting. I hope we have enough fuel. We should. We have, um. Just maybe fuel, maybe. No, we, we should have enough fuel. We got like 40 gallons on, so. And there's only an hour flight, so, um. Yeah, see how it goes. Uh, I, I promise you in real life I'm gonna do much better planning than this, but uh, yeah. this has gone to really good to uh, sort of bad. Lining up on the runway. Ok, 
Okay, zero four on the compass, zero four on the DG, zero four on the numbers, and uh, here we go, full power. RPM's good, T's and P's are good, speed's alive. 55 and rotate. And up we go. Take off attitude, let the aircraft accelerate. 75, pitch for 80 now. Get that VY attitude, trim it. Trim for that VY attitude, that's good. Our first heading will be 073, and it's basically going to be a straight out departure, really. Let's go 300 feet, flaps up, fuel pump off, oil, T's and P's are in the green. Everything's looking good. I mean, um, this engine is uh, not new anymore. I've, I've actually r broken it in and uh, done all the good stuff. Changed my oil to um, multi-weight. So uh, hopefully that does something good to it. Multi-weight, it holds the viscosity better. So hopefully that would uh, treat my engine a little bit better. Uh, I guess we could turn to 073 now and no real traffic in the area and this is an uncontrolled airport so we could really do whatever the hell we want as long as it's safe 073 that's about right yeah mate yeah that looks about right cruise climb that looks about right cruise climb attitude right we're gonna level off at 3500 today and uh, this will be a nice cruise, first leg down to Latrobe Valley. And if you haven't already noticed, uh, my ADF picked up the NDB signal, so that's good. That's good. And uh, there is a crosswind from the left because it's a northerly wind, so it is normal. The, the NDB is pointing at the direction the, uh, the beacon is, and we are only flying tracks, we are not flying headings. So we are heading 073 and we'll be tracking to 078 because of the winds, obviously. So we need to compensate for the winds. Climbing slightly better than forecast. Forgot to got my, get my timer, but doesn't matter. My first uh, leg is technically just to the to the level off point. We just add a minute to it, I guess, and, uh, yeah, 2,500, we're climbing better than, uh, better than expected, so, um, we should be a little bit early on that, I'll need to log that in, I'll need to put that on my, uh, on my nav log that I have on paper that I printed out from Sky Vector, so let's see how accurate Sky Vector is in regards to wind. Uh, on my first go, it was really accurate. On my first go, which didn't manage to make the cut because there isn't the audio. But uh, yeah, it went really well, um, surprisingly. Because I rarely do these flights on Flight Sim. On Flight Sim, I usually, you know, go on the GPS, go on autopilot, you know, have a drink or something. But no, this is what you would do in real life. And 3,500 feet to go. Uh, T's and P's are still in the green, so my engine is not go probably not going to fail. I've maintained this aircraft pretty well, so um, I hope she would treat me well. <laughs> so, yep, coming up. Coming up here, 3,500. Simulator's still running pretty well, no issues there. I'm hoping the audio works this time. Please make it work. Fifty feet to go, and we're gonna level off. Gonna log the time. The time is three minutes to cruise altitude, and our next heading is zero six eight, which is just a slight turn to the left. And that was about right. Yep. Level off, mate. Right. Logging zero six. Uh, logging. Three minutes, and then time starts again. 
And this time we need to, uh, we are having how many minutes? We are 20 minutes and we should be uh, overhead Electro Valley. So we'll see. All right, let's do a clear off check. So course is good. Log is uh, done and time has started again. Engine, T's and P's are good. Uh, altimeter is set, 1009. Um, radio is good for now. Uh, oil uh, orientation is good and um, fuel is good for now. That's the clear off checks. Complete. Let's do a dummy check. So we have just departed. There should be some high ground there, yep. High ground there. Some towns there, yep. Seems like we are on course. We'll see soon. We in in around the midpoint we'll have two townships to our left hand side. Slightly off the heading, but you know, all good. One or two degrees off, it's uh, not not too much of a deal. You, of course, you want to fly the most accurate headings, but uh, you know that's all you can do with an analog gauge, and that's why we have the end. Uh, we have the ADF telling us where exactly uh, Electro Valley is. We have one minute in now. I'm already feeling bored. Well, so how's your day today? My day's been good, except um. Except for this recording, uh, it, it's it's really uh, been a pain in the ass, and uh, yeah. But uh, third time's lucky. Hopefully, third time's the charm. Hopefully, this one works, and uh, hopefully, I can get it up on YouTube before tomorrow. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, just some announcements uh, about real life flying is uh, this November I'll be going back to Australia. Um, I'll be getting my cross-country endorsement, and then uh, moving on to my PPL, and then my Recreational Aviation Australia, RAOS, Flight Instructor Rating. Now that is v something that's very exciting. That's coming up. I will be documenting it, hopefully, on the channel. With I'm buying a GoPro, by the way. So, um, yeah, hopefully I get that. I'm also buying a new computer this September, so hopefully I get better flight sim footage, and uh, hopefully I get better... V hopefully I can f start editing videos. Uh, because I have more powerful uh, graphics card on that new computer. So that's good. Uh, that's something to look forward to, I guess. And I mean, um, just, I mean, about the channel, uh, this channel is still going to be Flight Sim, but there will be real world aviation as well. Now, I know some people might not like it, but, you know, to each their own. Uh, I mean, I'm a real pilot after all. And I use Flight Sim to sort of, um, you know, I I'm a Flight Sim advocate. For a, in aviation, I believe flight sim is the reason why I um, sort of sped through my my recreational pilot training, and um, I actually found it not too bad. And um, I know a lot of you would disagree. And uh, honestly, there are hard parts. There are some really, really hard parts. But generally, I actually think flight sim helped a lot, especially in regards to um, um, procedures. Flight sim helped a lot. And also the general sort of feel, it might sound weird, but gen general feel for flying. So um, I know what to expect on, on that first lesson. I mean, it was a bit nerve-wracking at first, but, um, you know, you get used to it, you get used to it like, like all other things. We're well, four minutes in, into the 20-minute leg. Okay, let's see, 122 knots on the ground speed, 129 knots was uh, forecast. That's pretty close, actually. It's not bad. I bet in real life it's going to be way off. <laughs> I mean, I heard winds a lot forecast in real life are not actually that accurate. They get the Apparently they get the directions right, just not the velocities. Right, another dummy check. Uh, coming up on... Uh, on the high ground on our right, so I can see the topographic map I have on my phone. So uh, that's good. That that's looking good. High ground on my right hand side. I should have townships far to my left. 
just waiting for that to show up. Should be any time now. I should be a beam the beginning of the high ground and then I'll see the townships. This is this is a uh, dead reckoning. It's navigating by uh, landmarks, physical landmarks. And um I mean uh, talking to some pilots on the internet who's got their cross country endorsements. They always say when you try and identify something, you start from the large scale and then you sort of narrow the details down. And then that way you can identify things in a logical and sort of easy manner. And I mean, it works. It, it really does. It works really well. Um, on my first time I recorded this, which of course didn't make the cut because, you know, sort of didn't work. Um, I used that and it works really well. So this time I'll be using it as well. And uh, yeah. Okay, getting a bit of downdraft and a bit of updraft. Bit bumpy. Alright, approaching that. Township. Yep, I see townships off to my left. Bad textures, I know. Some people might not see it, but I'm just used to it. Yep. Yep, we're on the right track. High ground to the right, township to the left. That's it. That's it. That's awesome. That's, that's really good. Once again, it's working. You know, this just proves that, you know, these basic navigation tools can uh like gps can never replace these basic navigation tools like i have my gps on right now but that's mainly for safety in case i actually embarrass myself and sort of get lost and i mean it's the same thing in in your nav solos when you do your uh, cross-country endorsement is that you would be allowed to have your gps on and you'll be taught how to use your gps but you are not allowed to use that as a primary means of navigation you're meant to use this exactly this as your primary means of navigation which is absolutely reasonable i think and uh yeah great we ran out of stuff to talk about yeah oh anyway um let's talk about um planes obviously uh personally i mean i fly the cessna 172 and uh, of course i've flown the sling and i will fly it again soon i got to say Cessna 172s are bloody mediocre planes, and um, I have nothing against them, honestly. They're well built. They're they're solid. They're bloody solid. But the sling is just... It's a pilot plane, the sling. It, it feels... Everything feels so right. It's just... I don't think anything can replace the feel of a sling, because... Um, I mean, I'm I'm by no means paid by sling. I'm just a student who has done all his training on the sling, not most of his training on the sling. And I gotta say, the sling just feels so amazing. It's 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 a mixture between sensitivity, lightness, responsiveness, and sort of solidness. Like, because the sling was never designed as a light sport aircraft, you can fly long. It's designed as a long distance tourer, so you can fly long distance. Uh, in pretty heavy turbulence, like not heavy, but moderate turbulence, and it handles just fine. And, I mean, the Cessna, of course, it handles turbulence even better because it's heavier. But it is so heavy on the controls, and uh, the yoke doesn't feel right. The stick feels better on the sling. Like, yokes actually don't feel right. That's my weird opinion on yokes. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel natural. The sling has a nice floor-mounted center stick electric trim and everything feels right on that plane the trim has plenty of feedback so you'll know exactly when to let go of that trim button but it's great it's it's such an awesome plane i can't wait to go back to oz to uh to fly it again and to train on it again and uh i mean i, I, re I weirdly i look forward for our building for my instructor rating just so i can fly the sling like all over victoria <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the sling is just such a nice plane to fly and I mean, I mean, I have nothing against Cessnas. I think Cessnas are re super robust. They are super benign uh, in the stall realm. But they're just a bit boring. And they feel a bit weird to fly. After flying the sling, you'll find the Cessna to be super weird. Like with the yoke. Uh, those things are like bullhorns. They're, they're, they're pretty bad. Alright, we're coming up on that township here. Let's check out time. We're nine minutes. Halfway. Yeah, that looks about right.
Right, and also the NDB indicating that my uh, the airport is our our one o'clock position, which uh, makes sense. We crabbed over because uh, we have uh, we we have uh, wind coming from the north. Right, ten minutes, and we are halfway there on our first leg. Oh, and it's 10.30 p.m. here in Hong Kong. Only starting, not starting, but finishing up my first work. Oh well, that's just life, isn't it? You know, even in the simulator, unexpected things happen. Especially on this crap computer I have, a lot of unexpected things happen. So, uh, so that's actually one of the reasons why I'm not that active on YouTube. Because my this computer is sort of starting to conk out on me. And uh, yeah, it is time for a replacement, so yeah. That's one of the reasons why I, I'm not so active on YouTube. But no worries, I'm still alive, and um, I'm still flying. So hopefully I can get more videos up once things change. Right? a bit closer and getting into the valley the actual Latrobe Valley which is the which is of course the name of the airport it's actually situated in the valley the northerlies picked up a bit all right it's fine slightly right of track slightly because of this body of water, we should be over it, but slightly right of track, but we're still alright. I, I, I take this, this is less than a mile, half a mile of track, that's completely fine, that's actually really good. Just a half a mile off track, that's actually not bad. Fuel, radio, engine, DI, and altimeter is good. Plenty of uh, force landing options here. One of the rare cases that I'd say I feel comfortable losing an engine. <laughs> right, we are in uh, east, no, west sail airspace now. Okay, 12 minutes. On our last half of this leg. And after this leg, it'll be a right turn to uh, 2. Three seven degrees. It's two four zero. Or if I like to round it up, just three months. It's just yeah. It's not that. It's not that much of a long leg. The next leg is just how many minutes? Nineteen minutes. Yeah, it's about the same. But all right. Right. We're coming into the Latrobe Valley, the actual valley itself, not the airport. So we have mountain on the right, mountain on the left and should be the airport in front all right let's look at the features so we have a uh, lake to the left of the airport with rivers on the left of the airport yes i see the lake that should be the lake should be the lake as well two lakes okay so the airport should be sh around yeah it should be I mean, I'm just verifying my, my ADF readout. Basically, yep, my ADF is reading the right thing and hasn't malfunctioned. Right, that's good. Yeah, we have the lake. We have the township also on the uh, right in front of us and stretching to our left. And we should have Latrobe Valley emerging anytime. Uh, it is, Latrobe Valley is a pretty sneaky airport, that's why I noticed. And uh, last time when I tried recording this, yeah, it, it was pretty hard to spot. And, uh, but it does it does show up, and um, you, you can definitely see it, it's definitely doable. If it's not doable, then there's no reason why instructors would send you... This is actually the exact route that will be flown for my cross-country solos. So, yeah. This is going to be the exact route that's going to be flown. Yep, we have the township, left, lake, and uh, lake should be leading to the airport in front. Yes, there's an, the other lake, yep, yep, that's good. 
slightly right of track, but that's good. Only like a, a mile, a half mile. Yeah, I see the airport just here. Yeah, awesome. Hey, that's how you identify an airport. Is you see the ground features, and then you slowly narrow it into the direction of the airport. That's how you do it. I think that's how you do it in real life. That's how you do it on the simulator. Don't take my word for it. That's how you do it on the simulator. If you really want to do this, get Orbex scenery and, you know, knock yourself out. Have fun. And also, don't forget, I am also running OZX. O -Z -X. That's uh, a basically scenery package with uh, a bunch of small airstrips. Turidin is not on the default FSX database. That's actually an OZX airport. Actually, very, very well done, Aussie Access. More than like three gigs of data. It's great. It adds a whole ton of landmarks to Australia. It adds a whole bunch of small, like, private airstrips in Australia. Amazing. Great add on. All free. You just download it. It's, it takes a while, but it's worth the, the effort. Yeah, that's it. That's Latrobe Valley. That's confirmed. The Latrobe Valley confirmed. That's the tower here. Yep, that's it. It's the, uh, Latro Valley right here. I bet it's more beautiful in real life. <laughs> At least in real life you don't even watch textures load. <laughs> right, it's going well. This is actually going really well, as well as my first attempt. Wow. This is going exactly like my first attempt. Like, <laughs> actually going like my first attempt. Really, really, really well. This kind of... I like this. I mean, I really like this sort of flying. Don't know why I don't do it more often. Probably because of the planning that's required. It took 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 me a while to plan for, plan this. I mean, I'm using Active Sky next, real weather, so I can use actual planning resources. Slowly watching textures load up. It's pretty amusing. Oh, that's a factory. Hey, it's got smokes and every. Oh. That's, that must be an Aussie X uh, landmark. That's actually really nice. It's got smoke and everything. That's so cool. Wow. That's really cool. It'll be just interesting to see in real life if, if that factory is still in operation. Textures are loading up slightly, slowly, slowly but surely. Oh, that's actually really cool. Oh, very interesting. Huh. The wonders of flight simulator. Right. Okay, we're right on track right now. We're tracking nicely to the Trobe Valley. Uh, 17 minutes, 3 minutes out. Basically on time. Estimated to be 20 minutes. Let's see. Probably slightly behind. Slightly slower. It might take slightly longer time, but it shouldn't be too far out. Actually, really nice. I love this sort of flying. Should do this more often. It's just fun. It's fun to do this. You know what I say? You know what I'm saying? It's really fun. That's the Trove Valley right there. That's definitely the Trove Valley. That's exactly the, how the airport looks like. Great, awesome. Yep, lake on the left. Perfect. Lake on the right. Perfect. That's exactly like oh that that went really well. Okay. Okay, eighteen minutes now, approaching nineteen minutes. I think we're pretty on time. This one. And next we'll be tracking to Leon Gaffer, that'll be nineteen minutes. That should go pretty well. As long as we keep those headings right, that should go pretty well. Okay, uh, airports just disappeared under my nose. This is when I use the GPS or the uh, ADF. The ADF would flip when I'm actually over it. Just gonna wait, really. Just gonna wait until I'm actually over it, and then I'll do the time turn talk. That's what it is. Time, you reset the timer. Turn, you get the heading, and then if you need to talk, then talk. Time turn talk. Needle starting to flip, slowly starting to deflect. That's not the time. 19. 
47 minutes. Nine, 1947 seconds. Time. Turn. 237, so 240. And don't need to talk. There we go. And we are turning tracking direct to Leon Gatha. Once again another overfly. That will take about that will take 19 minutes as forecast. And I reckon we should be pretty close to 19 minutes. 24 to 4 rolling out. Course log engine altimeter Radio, orientation, fuel, clear off checks complete. Right, that's the clear off check. Nice! Nice, I'm loving it. I am loving it. Slightly to the left of 24, that's it, that's around 237, we should be really at, but. Yeah, you know, we could be slightly right of track, we can afford that. Because during the turn, that actually brought us slightly left of track. This is a very slight, so, yeah. So we've got the clear off checks out of the way. I'll be Leon Gathler next. We won't actually land there. Originally planned to, but because of time, we're not actually going to land there. We're just going to overfly. And, uh, oh, my hands are getting sweaty again. That's why I wear gloves when I fly in real life. So my hands don't get sweaty, and the sweat won't sort of s help let my hands slip on the controls. It has happened before. Back in the day, I didn't fly with gloves, and um, I've slipped on the controls before, especially on the 172. That thing's heavy. I mean, it's not really on the sim. On the sim, it's nice and light, which is weird. But uh, uh, in in, re in the real life, it is really heavy. It's pretty heavy plane compared to the sling. The sling is a sort of three finger control plane, really. That's all you need on the sling. Uh, otherwise, anything more than that, you'll be over controlling it. Nice. The clouds cleared up a bit on the on the first time I recorded this. The clouds were it was a bit cloudy here, but uh, pretty good now. Seems like it's cleared up. A fair bit. Uh, I like this. Good weather. Good for nav solos. Three minutes. About 16 minutes to go. Let's do a dummy check. Almost forgot that. Right hand side. No, hang on. Left hand side is a lake. That's the lake. That's it. On our left hand side, about a mile. Half a mile, quarter of a mile, three quarters of a mile. Yeah, that's it. That's the lake. That's it. Yeah, that's prominent feature. Use that for a dummy check. Make sure that if it if you're on the so I'm on the right of the lake. Lake. If you're on the left of the lake, then there's obviously something wrong. But this is a it's a good way to sort of verify your. I mean, compass and uh, timer surprisingly accurate, but um, you know nothing can replace pilotage, dead reckoning. Seems to be a road. Yeah, I am following a road as well. Yeah, that's the road. Yeah, it's on the map as well. Following the road. Okay. Not really following it, but there should be a road running on off to my left. Which, yeah, that's another good feature for my dummy check. It's actually called a gross error check, but I like to call it a dummy check. It's to make sure that I'm not being a dummy. You know. I mean, and also part of the reason why perhaps this is easy is uh, not because of the sim. I actually believe the sim makes it a bit harder because of the bad textures I have. But part of the reason why I, I find this easy is because I used to kayak a lot. And I, I, when I mean kayak, it's not just, you know, kayaking out on the coast. It's actual, like, kayaking trips that you need to plan on the compass. Again, the compass, timer, map, dead reckoning, 
and pilotage. That's what you need to do. And yes, in marine terms, it is still called dead reckoning and pilotage. Pilotage actually came from um, sailors. So um, interesting fact of the day. So uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, like to all of you, like if, if you're a student pilot watching this, and um, I mean my classmate in flight school, he says the same thing because he's a hiker. He does a lot of land nav, land navigation. So uh, he says it's like if you do a lot of navigation that's not aviation related, you'll still find this really easy. Like you, you'll find cross country really easy. I guess that's why. That's part of the reason why I, I, I'm, I'm really accustomed to using compasses. That's the thing. It's like it's just a part of like what I used to do. Is that I, I use compasses to, to navigate. Compass, timer, map. You know that's everything. <laughs> You know, and those kayaking trips that I, I go on, we aren't allowed to use GPSs because they're one of they're some of those outward bound ones. So um, we aren't allowed to use GPSs. We like the instructors are equipped with GPSs, but all we we have is compass and map and the timer, and that's it. I mean, it's actually not that hard. It, you 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 verify it with um, outside references, so pilotage and dead reckoning. And you're fine, you're basically like, you're super accurate, you're just almost as accurate as a GPS. And I mean, kayaking is even harder because you need to take into account current flow and also wind. So, it's two things to take into account. And also compasses can break. <laughs> the compasses is no it's nothing like the aviation compasses we have. So, um, yeah, you'd imagine. So, leaving the airspace soon. Six minutes, 13 minutes to go. This is nice. I like this sort of navigation. It's satisfying. It's actually very weirdly satisfying. Like GPS, you know, you can just slap on direct to autopilot, but that's not fun. It's taking out the fun part of it. This is, this is fun. This keeps you on your toes, keeps you alert. Especially now it's late. I mean, if I if I have GPS, I'll be tired. But now I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm alert because I'm aware I can get lost, and I don't want to. Look at this terrain. I don't want to get lost here. See how close my ground speed is. 112 knots. 100. Oh, that's actually really close. 109 on the nav lock. 112 actual. That's pretty good. I'm liking this. I should do this more often. I think. Yeah. I mean, it's glad to see that this works on the set. It's not just a thing that is exclusive to real life. I mean, I guess you have to have Orbex or some sort of accurate VFR scenery to do this, but, you know. After you get that, have fun. You can do this. This is fun. This is really fun. All you need is Sky Vector, Active Sky Next, Navlog, a bit of maths, and that's it. Probably an E6B if you're a real pilot. Like me. I have an E6B. Whiz wheel. Bloody hate that thing. <laughs> it takes, takes forever to make one calculation. It's just like, how do we make this... It's just like the makers of the E6B. How do we make this the most complicated thing ever? Oh, let's do that. Let's make it in a wheel that you have to turn. And, uh, I guess it's not complicated. I mean, for the older generation, it's actually pretty simple. It's called it's just a slide rule. That's all it is. I mean, for us bloody millennials, we need calculators and everything. Back in the day, they didn't need anything. They didn't have those. So yeah, I, I mean, pilots are getting lazier. I admit it. I, I'm, I'm part of the lazy generation. I mean... They say I'm the sort of like what the children of the magenta line or something, yeah. And I like to reject that label. I'm not using any magenta lines here. I'm actually using like the most rudimentary type of navigation, but also the most accurate when done well. Ooh, updraft. Updraft. Take take advantage of it. Should get more speed out of this one. Right, fuel is still looking good. T's and P's still looking good. The vacuum air meter is still good. What else? I like to do an L, sort of L-shaped scan. Uh, sometimes when I'm en route. 
I, I like to do that. That that sort of, you know, that tells all the the entire story about the engine, basically. I mean, whether or not I need a precautionary landing or a diversion or anything. Ten minutes, nine to go. We are halfway. No real features around here. Uh, high terrain to my right. Yep. Dropping, falling terrain to my left. Yep, that's it. <sighs> oh, this is fun. I should do this more often. Keeps me on my toes. Keeps you guys entertained. Hopefully. You guys hopefully aren't bored. I mean, you guys, you guys should do this similar sort of thing as well. It's really fun. It's surprisingly fun. Not surprisingly, but it's really fun. And it's actually not that hard. It's not my fuel. Uh, fuel's on both. That's good. It's a bit of an uneven burn there. Okay. Good weather though. And yeah, we definitely have enough fuel. We have like 30 gallons. <laughs> Burning 10 gallons now. We have 3 hours of fuel, but we have less than an hour to fly now. Plenty of fuel. Pl pretty light as well, so. Yeah. Golf course. Tons of golf courses in Melbourne. Don't know why. Probably why retired people love living out here. I mean, I actually really like speaking. Like, this is completely non-aviation related, but you know, I I love it when you know, if you, any of you watch Top Gear, the old Top Gear I'm talking about, Jeremy Clarkson, James May, Richard Hammond, you know, those three. I love it when they make fun of golfing. <laughs> They're like, no, golfing is bad. It's like golfing is boring. Rally cross is better. It, it's actually really funny. Uh, I I miss the old Top Gear, honestly. I, I genuinely miss it. I, it was a bad decision firing Jeremy because they should have known better that Hammond and May would not have liked it. I mean, I, I love the Grand Tour. I watch it. Amazing show. Great, great show. They made it even funnier. They have a massive budget to play around with now. It's just funny. Uh, I love those three. I mean, also fun fact, Richard Hammond and James May, they're both pilots. Richard Hammond's a helicopter pilot. James May is a fixed wing pilot. Yeah, which is good. And Jeremy Clarkson, I think, is a boat driver. He's a licensed boat driver. That's really cool. I mean, those three, those three, they really know how to make a show funny. Like, um, Chris Evans, when I watch, uh, honestly, it's not, not great. I won't say I hate him, but not great. I don't really have an opinion on him, honestly. But it's gone, the Top Gear magic. You know, the Top Gear spirit of, oh, how hard can it be? Or what could possibly go wrong? Or oh cock, I mean James May. <laughs> oh man, I love James May. You know, some people they ask me, Howard, what pilot do you really want to fly with? Interestingly, it's like of course I want to fly with you know the great Harrison Ford, Bob Hoover, but I want to fly with James May. I I would love to see his oh cock attitude in a cockpit. That'll actually be really funny, like. I believe he's safe, but he would be a bit of a comedian in the cockpit, I gotta admit. It would actually be really hilarious. Speaking of hilarious, six minutes out. Yeah, but it would actually be really hilarious watching him. Like, I, 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 I discovered that James was the pilot through the Bugatti Veyron vs. Airplane episode when he flew a 182. And it was so badly planned by him. Uh, he, he didn't have his NVFR rating and had to land, had to catch public transport. Of course they lost. But yeah, James is an actual pilot. Really interesting. And, and Richard is an actual helicopter pilot. I believe he flies an EC-120 or something like that. He's, he's a real adventure man. I mean, just now I touched on Harrison Ford. I mean... Uh, I guess everybody, when they hear of Harrison Ford, is, oh, that bloke who landed on the taxiway. I mean, I gotta say, he, he, I, I know he's, he's, of course, he's a pilot. What the fuck? What airfield is that? 
Is that Leon Gaffer? I'm I'm way off to the right, am I? <laughs> oh crap! This is not working as well as I thought it would. Okay, I'm off to my to the right. Uh, Leon Gaffer is over there. Uh, 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 that's not good. Oh, let's verify this. This is Leon Gaffer. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Carried away with conversation. Yep. A bit off to the right, mate. There's a bit. Ah, uh, never mind. Just overfly it, reset, and yeah. All swap. Oh god. <laughs> oh man. Oh. Obviously getting tired and complacent. I was like, what the hell? Why is there an airfield on on my right? And I saw the GPS, and I'm like, what the hell? Oh well. I'm I'm not that far off track though. Two two six. Yeah, I tracked too much two four zero. I really shouldn't have. I really shouldn't have rounded it up. I should have just gone with two three seven, stuck with it. I mean, the winds aloft is exactly how it's um, forecasted. It was definitely my fault. Anyway, let's overfly Leon Gaffer. Prepare to log the time as well. It's time to talk. Oh, okay. This didn't go as well as I thought. Okay. Oh well. 16 minutes, we're slightly ahead of schedule, looks like. Using the GPS, so you see when I'm overhead, Leon Gaffer. Yeah, we look about overhead. 17 minutes. Time. Turn. Turn next heading is two nine nine. Yeah. Talk, don't need to talk. Two nine nine. Start the timer. Actually three zero zero would do. That's just one degree off. Right. That's good. Course, log, engine, altimeter, radio, orientation, fuel, clear off checks complete. Okay. Yeah, so Richard Hammond's an actual helicopter pilot, so it's really interesting to, uh, yeah. I mean, um, if any of you guys haven't, I really recommend watch, uh, you guys reading um, Jeremy Clarkson's books, like The World According to Jeremy Clarkson and How Hard Can It Be and stuff like that. Hilarious. Very funny. Very funny commentary on the real world as well. On the absurdities of modern life, basically, yeah. It's, it's actually really interesting. I have no idea why I'm talking about non-aviation topics, but, you know, this was never meant to be a really serious flight. It's just meant to be something fun, something experimental. I anticipate we might be slightly right of track. Let's do a dummy check township. It's probably right behind me. Alright. Let's go, we should just keep this heading. Alright, okay. Bay is on my left. Alright. So yeah, I mean, um, Top Gear. Forever remembered. But the Grand Tour is a new thing, and I really like the Grand Tour, I gotta say. I mean, I especially like the first... I think, yeah, that was the first episode. When they were pretending to be special forces. And that, that was really funny. And I love their new budget. It's actually really fun. I mean, I like the cheap car challenges that Top Gear, you know, does. But it's a bit repetitive sometimes. It's like, you know, it's the same old formula. James Maybach is an old piece of shit. Richard Hammond, you know, thinks he's so good. Jeremy Clarkson goes on all about power. 
So there you go. It's it's a bit formulated, and I mean it's funny. The the three blokes are really funny, but and I enjoy it. I enjoy every minute of it. But um, yeah, it's just a bit formulated and a, a bit expected. I mean, I guess my favorite cheap car challenge was the I think one of their last ones, the the retro hot hatchbacks challenge, when um. They did the supermarket sweep and everything. That was really funny. Right, our top of descent is at six minutes out. So it would be 17 minus six. That would be 11 minutes we'll start at our descent when we're 11 minutes out. It's descent at 500 feet per minute to 1,500 feet for an oblique downwind rejoin. So runway 04, it'll be a right-hand circuit actually because um, we have to do circuits over the sea for some reason. Oh, not, not for some reason, because they're skydiving over the land. So, yeah. Hate doing right-hand circuits. Hate, hate, hate doing right-hand circuits. Fuel, radio, engine, DI, altimeter is set. Fuel, T's and P's, vacuum, and ammeters, good. Alright, and we're heading home. Let's hope the scenery loads properly this time, unlike the first time when I recorded. But I guess that's too much to ask for on my old proc of shit. This computer is like four years old, and this shit is like Intel integrated graphics, which is really bad. Super slow at loading everything. You know, waiting for my flight sim to load up now is literally like 10 minutes for it to load up. Pretty bad, if you ask me. Bay is on our left. That's the dip in the bay. There, that's there. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, high terrain should be on our right. Yeah, see that? Yep. It's very important on these legs that you don't just sort of hold the compass heading and forget it. You have to keep on checking that your compass heading is right by looking outside, trying to compare yourself to other you know, fe land features, landmarks, landforms, etc. Have to keep doing that. Right, five minutes. Uh, close to halfway. Not yet, but close. Quarter of a way, a third of a way there. A bit bumpy today. Oh, and also. I did some tweaks on my FSX config and I actually finally got my wide view aspect um, set and also um, I got my joystick to act as linear so my flaring has been uh, much smoother these days which is good I mean it's much more like the real thing now and uh, yeah and if you guys don't know how to make how to do that just google it FSX linear joystick something like that and then you know, tons of results pop up. I mean, a lot of people say that that tweak actually, you know, they'll oh, a lot of side effects is that oh, you you can't deflect the controls as much, but it's only really a 20% decrease. It's like when you're flying these small aircraft, it doesn't matter. Smoothness matters more to me than about these like small little issues that only affect like aerobatic flying that I don't do. I mean. <laughs> The flight sim doesn't even have feel anyway, so it doesn't matter to me. Like, as long as it works, and it works better, it's fine, it's enough for me. Alright, four minutes out for the des to the descent. We've been running for 52 minutes according to my ADF.
this aircraft, A2A, I just love A2A, the wear and tear, engine wear and tear modeling is excellent. I mean, I have uh, been taking care of this engine very well, and she's been taking care of me very well as well. Running very well. Cylinder compressions were really, like, stellar, the compressions results. It was like 75 over 80 on like all cylinders, so it was really good. And um, engine's running really smooth as well, so that's that's good. That's always good to see. I mean, this multi-weight oil is actually really good for your engine, especially after the engine braking. That's what you really need, the multi-weights. You can use straight weight forever, but it's just really bad. It, it, it's not good oil. It's the viscosity, you know, it changes so much with temperature, you know. There's no real guarantee to you. But you know, multi-weight is expensive, so, yeah. But I believe, I believe the Rotax uses multi-weight. I'm not sure. I, I believe the Aero Shell is multi-weight, I'm not sure. And oh, also, uh, Lycoming versus Rotax. I mean, so many people are saying, like, oh, Rotax has reliability issues, blah, 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 blah. I mean, the, 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 I gotta say, the age of Rotax reliability issues are over. Rotax is proving themselves to be one of the most, if not the most, reliable light sport aircraft manufacturer, um, engine manufacturer in the world. It's it's amazing, their reliability. And, you know, it's, it's super easy to operate as well. As a pilot, no mixture to care about. Crack the ignition and just starts like a car and that thing is so smooth so quiet uh, thanks to the re reduction drive gearbox it burns barely any fuel you basically don't need a refuel for the entire day of, of flight training i'm talking about so it's really good Ro Rota i think wrote uh, all right this is just my humble opinion but rotax is the way forward lycoming these hot difficult to start engines they're gonna be phased out soon. I, like, I mean, I, I acknowledge Lycoming is a super, super, super successful engine manufacturer, bulletproof engines. But Lycoming's uh, Rotax is catching up so quickly, so quickly. Rotax, especially with the 912 IS, the injected version. Damn, that thing burns next to nothing. The sling I flew for most of my training, that has the IS engine. That thing burns like no fuel. I swear, that thing burns no fuel. It's like 10 liters an hour. Crazy. 10 liters an hour is like 3 gallons an hour. 3 or 2, like 2.5 gallons an hour. Absolutely like mad. How can it burn so little fuel? And like, alright, 10 liters an hour, it has 150 liters in total. It's crazy. That thing burns like nothing. Alright, coming up on my descent point. Right. Pulling the engine RPM back slightly just to let the nose sort of drop. I'm not playing around anything with the trim, I'm just adjusting my power to get that 500 feet a minute descent because I don't want to lose speed in the descent. I actually want to use the descent as an advantage to gain some speed so I don't need to take that much time to get there. I have turned in the side already. I don't really need position checks because I know this airport so well. I actually do. <laughs> I mean, I fly out of here in real life for my solo flights only. But, you know, I'm, I'm used to flying from Moravin to Turidin and then Turidin to Moravin, so... You know, I have a sort of a cross-country background, a little bit of sort of cross-country like flying, a bit of navigation definitely involved. So, actually, I feel really grateful in the fact that I, I'm in a school that has a policy of soloing out of Turidin. And also because it's RARs, it can only do that. So I feel grateful in that sense that we can so we can only solo out to it. In. Because like a lot of people think it's a waste of time. I don't because it teaches it taught me basic navigation, fundamentals of navigation that I need. 500 feet a minute right there, about 1900 RPM. Uh, let's get that to 2000. 2000. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Deciding to 1-5 first. Ah, uh, got a downdraft. Uh, and it's back. Okay. 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 When I join the circuit, I'll just stop the timer and I'll log it down later. Should be about 17 minutes. Should be, should be pretty on time. Right. Brakes. Undercarriage mixture. 
fuel instruments, switches, hatches, harnesses secure. So my pre-landing check do it a bit earlier. And then we can follow it up on downwind. Two five one thousand to go. It's been a long day trying to record this, hopefully this thing works. And hopefully the runway textures load up. The first time when I recorded, the runway textures didn't load up. So basically I landed on something like a translucent runway. Really weird. Seems like the scenery is loading up better than last time though. Slightly. Slightly. Only very slightly better. Yeah, that's turgid. Let's level off at 1.5 for now. The runway texture should load up any minute. Hopefully. Depends on my computer's mood. Right, leveling off at 1.5. Don't want to push the throttle in because I want the circuit power setting now, so I can just leave it here and then it rolls itself back to 1900 basically so you feed it in a little bit, there we go, that's the runway texture is loaded up uh, crank it over, over to the right a bit for a downwind join alright, coming down to uh, 1900 should give us around 95 knots 90, 95 knots, that should be around there. I mean, we're light, it should be 95. Let's join an oblique downwind. That means a 45 to left downwind. Let's descend to 1000 now. For the join. Hopefully the scenery loads this time. Please, runway textures, keep loaded. Don't memory dump. Keep it loaded. Please. 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 I want a nice little runway to land on. Not just blank textures. Right, joining the circuit now. Stop the time. Uh, log it later. This, this, these textures are shit. Honestly. This is so bad. Turning downwind. Might be a bit wide, but you know, I hate right hand circuits, so I don't mind being a little bit wider. Than usual. I, I, I'm pretty confident I will make it back in case of an engine failure. If I turn straight away to the runway, I'll make it back. Brakes, undercarriage, mixture, fuel, instruments, switches, hatches, harnesses. Oh god, textures aren't loading up. Jeez. Hate my computer sometimes. Anyway. Hopefully it does. Hopefully it changes its mind. Who knows? But I'm still pretty happy in that this was a successful navigation exercise without basically without GPS, close to, without GPS as your primary tool as navigation. Uh, that's about 95 knots now, that's pretty good. Uh, 45. 1500, one stage of flat and turn. Second stage of flat, nose down. Don't get below 75 knots. Uh, 
Alright, a bit high, so I'm going to kill the throttle a bit. On final, usually, you see me going at 70 knots, but since there's a short runway, it's Turidin, it's 900 meters long only, I'm going to go 65 all the way down. I can go all the way down to 60, according to the POH. Oh god, runway textures aren't loading up again. Jeez. This doesn't really help, honestly. I should seriously get a new computer. I should really get a new computer. Oh, okay. Simulator froze up. Probably s computer deciding it's time to load up scenery. Yeah. So how's your day been? Mine's been pretty good. I don't, know, I don't know about yours, but I'm just waiting for scenery to load. Wasting my damn time. But yeah, just waiting for scenery to load. Yeah, nothing much to see here. Standard FSX doing a sling. Yeah, you know, this might take a while, but... Ah! So, what have we learned today? We have learned that the compass and the watch and the navlock three really really reliable navigation tools and that you should learn to use it properly even if you're only a sim pilot and you only if your only ambition is to fly on the sim you should learn to use it properly because it's really 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 useful and um, what else uh, buy a new computer for me because <laughs> it, uh, as you can see this whole thing is frozen it's loading scenery that's what it usually does it freezes up for a bit especially when it comes into this region load scenery and then i can fly again uh weird is it yeah welcome to my life and um yeah so uh, i mean I, I really encourage all of you to um learn to fly like this and uh, because you know it's going to improve you even as a simulator pilot it's going to improve your your dead rec your, your skills uh, dead reckoning pilotage you know you might be loading up a plane with no gps you don't want to fly ifr and you want to fly vfr so you might just need this this skill set to uh to deal with it so yeah i mean it's it's, it's a good it's a good skill set and it's also even better because we're waiting for scenery to load. That's, that's awesome. As you can see, I'm completely sarcastic there. But uh, yeah, waiting for scenery to load. Nothing much. Just yeah, sitting here with my hands off the controls, of course. Waiting for scenery to load to do its thing. Ah, so I guess you'll be seeing this frame for a while hope i keep you entertained so uh hopefully i get this video up in fact if you're watching this video you i got this video up if you're watching this video but um yeah hate my bloody laptop yeah if if you guys uh know of any fixes to this issue um, temporary fixes for this laptop, for this crap laptop that I'll get rid of soon. If you guys know of any fixes, please comment. Like, I need this thing fixed. Like, honestly. Because um, it, it's pretty annoying when you fly to this region, the Moorabbin region, and then this happens. It's annoying. It's irritating. It's frustrating. So, yeah. So, uh, just waiting. I mean, I actually want to record the landing, so you can see what um, the new joysticks uh, settings are like um, for landings. I mean, it is a, a lot smoother because the linear joystick basically a, a linear uh, con linear controls basically allows uh, your controls to. I mean, the simulator controls to mirror exactly the amount of deflection on your controls. So basically, um, if you deflect, let's say your controls one fourth of the way, the simulator would deflect its controls one fourth of the way. So basically, what linear controls allow you to do is it allows you to 
make small corrections and the simulator will be more sensitive to those small corrections. So unlike an exponential um, control setup, which is default to the FSX simulator, uh, if, it's expen if it's exponential, then um, you know, uh, when you are re reaching the extremities of your control deflections, one small control movement can result in a very massive change in the actual flight sim. And um, obviously it can be bad because of some really obvious reasons, like especially during the flare, during the round out, um, you're trying to you know get that fine elevator input and you can't because one small elevator movement is going to have a massive, massive difference. And of course that's bad. Is this thing going to load? Sometimes I wonder to myself. Doesn't have, it hasn't actually been that long since it froze, but yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's basically the basics of linearity and expo and exponential controls. So basically, joystick linearity. And um, the good thing about X plane is that um, it has, by default, the joystick linearity um, curves that you can that you can uh, use. So basically, it's like FSUIPC, except you don't need to pay for it, and you know it's native to the to the simulator itself that you can you know have really advanced programming of the controls for really really nice realistic setup. And I used to use X Plane 10, my and then uh, I sort of abandoned it because um, can't find a good 172 model for it, and then I switched to FSX because it's got this the A2A 172. Uh, I mean, it's a very good model, so. Um, I like it a lot. I fly it a lot. So, uh, so that's the only reason why I moved to FSX. And I mean, I'll stay with FSX for now because if I get a good computer, I tweak it. I don't mind tweaking. It's like I don't mind spending the time. So um, once I get the, once you get the tweaks down, really FSX runs really well, nearly just as well as X Plane. Um, but obviously, because of my computer now, as you can see, a freeze frame, uh, it's 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 not that good. It's not that ideal. Yeah. So um, I, I guess one of the advantages that X-Plane has over FSX is that X-Plane is a newer product, so it has DirectX 10 and it also has 64-bit um, by default. So that's one really good thing about X-Plane is that 64-bit basically allows you to use all your CPU cores if you have a multi-core multi CPU, um, which is good. I mean, it's obvious, it's good. So everything that every single resource that your laptop has or your computer has can be dedicated to X-Plane, which means better performance. You can run at higher settings and you don't have these issues. So uh, usually it is like this. It should unfreeze itself anytime and um, a whole bunch of scenery objects should pop up. Usually that's what happens when I go into Moravin at least. I mean, I've never really been into Turidin. I mean, when you fly from Moravin to Turidin, you never have this issue because it's actually in the same uh, region, Moravin and Turidin. So they're re really close. So I'd imagine the sim is they loaded up. So, yeah. I mean, Turidin Airport in, in, in real life is actually really interesting in the, f in the sense that I shouldn't say interesting, but in the sense that um, the runway is actually rather bumpy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not the best runway surface that I've felt, but honestly, it's not that bad. But yeah, it, it is bumpier than you know what you might expect from a you know asphalt tarmac runway. But uh, yeah, it's not that it's not that bad. It's 900 meters long. It is long enough for your touch and goes, but it's short that. It's it's short in the sense that you shouldn't shilly shally sort of with like flaps and everything. You should you know literally touch down, flaps up, full power and just go. Like, and you should check that whether or not you should check whether or not you have enough runway remaining for a touch and go, or else you might risk an overshoot, which is no good. Uh, I've never heard of that happening before, but uh, you know, you don't want to be the first one to overshoot the runway.
And Tur Turden is a pretty good airport to fly fly in and out of. Um, it's got a nice restaurant, I think, by the side of it. It's got, I think it's got wing, wings and fins or something. I think it's seafood. Never been there before, but heard it's, ex heard it's really expensive. But I don't know if it's good or not, but I guess it would be a pretty novel experience to be able to, f you know, fly in and eat and then fly back out. So and it's only a really short flight away from Moravin. It's only like, what, 20 minutes away. It's 20 miles, 20 nautical miles away from uh, from Moravin. So it's it's pretty easy to get to you. It's pretty hard to get lost on the way to Turidin, really. I mean, I've flown to Turidin so many times, so I I could say that, but I don't know about like a newcomer or something. But Tur Turidin Turidin air airfield is actually pretty hard to spot in real life because the runway is um a bit worn out. The runway uh, center line markings, and it's also obscured by trees. Um, especially when you come in from the southeast, uh, from the sorry, from the northeast, uh, from Moravian Airport, uh, it is obscured by trees. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's just this, it's just decided to load up runway. Oh, awesome. Okay, so okay. Uh, back to landing mode. Sixty-five knots. Okay, sixty-five. Right. Pitch undercarriage flat. Flaps down. Okay. Uh, Right, 65. Right, you want to keep 65 all the way down. Uh, I mean, 70 is good on long runways, but 65 is what you really want on Turidin. Because it's a short runway, it's 900 meters only. But really, you don't really want to go too far below 65, otherwise controls start becoming sloppy. Right, 2-4. That's good, that's confirmed. Power idle. <laughs> Floated more than I thought I would. Probably because I'm really light. Take this next exit. Awesome. And we're back. We are back at Turidin, lads. We are back. After a long and rather eventful flight, we are back at Turidin. Let's park it where we started. Let's not run into this Cherokee. Why is there a Jodel? Okay, let's park. Stop. Parking brakes set. Uh, I forgot to lean the mixture. I forgot to even raise the flaps. Obviously, fatigue setting in. It is pretty late. Get these two bits in. All the lights off. Don't want to blind everyone. And uh, dead cut check. All right. That's well, uh, 1200 RPM. Let it run for a bit. Oh, that's all stabilized and pull the power, pull the mixture. Sorry. Or idle, max, master. Fuel selector. That open. And control locks, wheel chocks, tie downs, pedo covers. And get out of the plane. Actually, I always forget this, even in real life. I always forget to close the window. Get out of the plane. And empty. And there we go. Welcome back to Turidan Airport, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's been very nice having you on board today, and uh, it's been nice having you listen to my banter, and especially that banter we had on final when the simulator decided it's time to take a break, and then decided it's time to work again. So, um, as usual, um, if you like it, like. If you don't, then don't. And I mean, 
uh, usual saying, have fun and fly safe. And remember, don't buy a computer as crappy as mine.